here, and we are in week two of our sermon series on nine flavors from one fruit. Uh, so we're going to be jumping around at a few different passages of Scripture today. Last week, if you remember, we talked about the first two fruit of the Spirit, the harvest, the outcome of the Spirit of God working in your life. Do you remember what they were? It was love. And joy, that's right, love and joy. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about peace, actually a lot about peace. My original plan was to preach on peace and patience, but there's just so much to say about peace, so that's what we're just going to focus in on today, is going to be about peace. And you know, when I think about peace, there are a few different things that I I think about. A lot does come to mind when I think about the peace that we're supposed to have, that surpasses all understanding. And one of the biggest things that comes to my mind is the lack of peace. You ever felt like that? (laughs) You're like, man, I'm supposed to have peace, but I have zero peace. We're anxious, we're worried, we're concerned. We stay up at night thinking about things and role-playing scenes in our mind, and we don't have any peace. We're worried about our bank account. We're worried about our future. We're worried about war. We're worried about our health. I mean, there are so many things to be worried about. And then add the whole layer of social media on top of it, and it is just a recipe for disaster. When I think about losing peace, Really, there are two things that come to mind. Number one, there are things that steal our peace, and they are uncontrollable circumstances. People die. Bad things happen to good people. I mean, there are things like we lose our job, or we maybe come down with some type of physical disease or injury or something that changes our life, and we lose our peace because we're concerned about what's going to happen. These uncontrollable circumstances change and dictate our future. But then there are also things that we do that give away our peace. We exchange our peace for sin. We exchange our peace for worldly pleasures and materials. And these things haven't come to take away our peace. We have invalidated our peace by our willful decisions and our choices. We give our peace away and we choose worry and anxiety and stress. And we choose to be at odds with God and the people around us because of our decisions. Peace, I think, is something that we all want, right? Don't you want to be at peace? But not all of us have peace. So today we're going to look at what is peace? What seals our peace? Why do we give up our peace? How do we get peace from God? And then what do we do once we have God's peace? So let's start off with what is peace? You know, for the Hebrews, if you look at the Old Testament and you look at what they meant when they said, peace be with you, shalom was their word for peace. What they understood the idea of peace was physical and material blessings. In other words, May the peace of God be with you. May you be healthy. May may you be wealthy. And that was their understanding of peace. It was driven from this idea of being happy and being satisfied with life. The Greek philosophers, their idea of peace was simply this. It's kind of funny. Maybe we've fallen trapped uh, into this, this idea. Was the elimination of desire, the death of emotion, The cessation of caring, the complete absence of depending on anyone or anything, and then you're finally at peace. Good luck. (laughs) But that's what a lot of the Greek philosophers strive for. I don't want to care what you think. I don't really care how you feel. I don't really care if I have anything to eat. It's really this apathetic approach to life. That's how they thought they could attain peace. But that's not how you get peace. And then there's the New Testament understanding The idea in the New Testament of this word of peace was an interlude of war. You have a peace treaty. Nobody's firing shots on either side. There is no inner struggle that is taking place. You're finally at peace and there is no war within you. It means to be in a state of mind where you feel the cessation of an eternal inner struggle against your own sin and your own suffering. Peace meant to them rest peace of mind. It literally meant this, to have all the parts joined together. Now, when we were children, we really didn't have a whole lot of video games, and so puzzles were something that we would do, right? A lot of you maybe still do puzzles, and that's probably because you're older. Uh, Kids are like, puzzles? Not doing puzzles? Waste of time. And if I do do a puzzle, it's going to be Tetris on a video game, right? Well, does anybody else feel the anxiety of stress of putting a, a puzzle together and there's no pieces like that, like the remaining pieces that you're supposed to put together are gone because some creep didn't put them back? Have you ever bought a puzzle at like Goodwill or something and not all the pieces were in the box and you feel this anxiety and this stress? Well, think about, think about it like this. How many of you sit in the car, okay? How many of you sit in the car to let the song finish? 
Anybody else? Does it not stress you out to cut off a song in the middle? You're like, look, I'm going to have to sit here for a few minutes while this finishes. That's, that's the idea of peace. It's the parts that are joined and, and they fit together. Or think of it like this. You get everything done for your job and you can finally relax on vacation. Everything's joined together. Everything's planned. You've delegated your responsibilities. You don't have to worry about responding to email. It's done. It's out of your mind. You can finally be at peace. Peace is having closure. It's having all the parts fit together. Um, I, can, I can think of several times where you buy something for the kids, right? You buy it off Amazon. It comes in the mail, and you start putting it together. And after you've gotten everything out of the box, after you've read the instructions, which I rarely do, you finally start putting it together and you find out something is missing. And so you've got a choice. <laughs> Do you call them and sit online for an hour as you get a piece of the part that you'll probably never get? Or do you take it apart, put it back together, send it back, get something new, and find out you've got the same problem all over again? Anybody been there, parents? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, the New Testament writers had this understanding of being at peace. Everything fits together. They're no longer at war. In classical Greek literature, they use this word peace to describe a state of law and order. That's what the word peace meant. We have law and order. There are rules, there are regulations, and we have people to enforce those. And guess what? Everyone's obeying them. That's the idea that they had in mind. They had peace because of, of their prosperity. Everyone was prospering because of the lawful type of lifestyle that they lived. That's what they meant by the word peace. You know, this word peace is used of the church when there was no persecution. The Bible says the church was at peace because they were no longer being persecuted by the world around them. Peace is used in the, in the Bible also to describe harmony between two people. You know what it's like to be at odds with somebody at your work, your own marriage, your kids, maybe a friendship, maybe even somebody in the church. Well, there's harmony now. There's peace. You're no longer at, at odds. You finally get along. And so for the most part, we all know, I think, what it means to, to be at peace, but where does peace come from? I mean, did the Greek philosophers have it right that we just really need to not care about life and then we'll finally have peace? Did the Hebrews have it right that the more we have health and wealth, we'll finally be at peace? Well, let's explore this idea. I was reading Don DeWalt this last week, and here's what he had to say. Peace comes when we are able to fasten our hopes upon a time when the enemies of peace will be removed and we will be able to enjoy our, our tranquility. In the midst of conflict, there is no hope for the removal of peace and it's impossible. And so his understanding of peace was that we look forward to one day when the enemies of peace will be gone and that brings us peace now. Well, what else does the Bible have to say about peace? Let me share with you Luke chapter 2, verse 14. It says this, Glory to God in the highest. It's Jesus' birth. And on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. Where does peace come from? Well, it starts with the proclamation of the gospel. Jesus' birth was announced with a dispensation at peace, and it was peace between us and God. When Jesus started his ministry, this is what he had to say. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see, the Pharisees developed these traditions and these laws outside of the Old Testament commands, and people were so burdened down by all the regulations, by all the political jargon, by all the PC culture. They had these traditions that they were forced to follow, and nobody could measure up, and they always felt like they were a failure. It's like trying to keep up on social media. You're like, man, I just can't keep up with everybody. Have you ever felt like that? You have no peace or trying to keep up with materialism? You got to have the right kind of job and make the right kind of money and dress in the white ray and live by our culture and their standards. And if you don't, you're not at rest. And here comes Jesus saying, look, don't burden yourself with the pressure of the world. Come to me, all who are weary, all who are burdened, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. They had this idea of a yoke that they would put around an animal and it would plow the ground and they were huge and they were heavy and they were this gigantic burden that would exhaust the animal. And Jesus says, look, I have a yoke, but it's not burdensome. It's light and it's easy to carry. He says, for I am gentle and I am humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The essence and the source of our peace comes from being right with God through the reconciliation that Jesus had to offer on the cross. 
That was one of the climatic verses in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Paul, he put it like this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we are right with God. We are not guilty. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I think one of the main reasons why our culture struggles with peace so much is because they don't feel like they're right with God. And when you don't feel like you're right with God, nothing else goes right. Yeah, your marriage could be healthy, but you're at odds with God. What, what, what's the good in that? Yeah, you have a stable job and you have a lot of money, but you know judgment day is coming. So where's the benefit and being at peace with the people around you when ultimately you know God is against you? And so the source of our peace comes first and foremost from being right with God. To be at peace with God is literally this. You're in a tranquil state of salvation because you fear nothing from God. Have you ever feared God? What he's going to do to you? How he's going to repay you back and whip that lash because you sinned against him? And how God is so angry at you, even though you're a Christian, he is just not going to discipline you. He is going to punish you and give you what you rightfully deserve. Have you ever lived in a state of fear with God, either before you became a Christian or now that you're a Christian? Well, being right with God means you can finally be at peace because you don't have to fear that God is ready to whip the lash at your back because you've made a mistake. That's not who God is. That's not how he operates. He wants to give you grace and mercy and suffer long with you and be patient with you. And so don't think just because something bad has happened to you that this is God cracking the whip because you're at peace with God. You know, Jesus not only makes us right with God, but when he invades our hearts and our minds, just what we're talking about, the fruit of the spirit that God has given us, he gives us the spirit of peace and we are commanded, we are obligated, we are told that we will be filled with peace in our hearts and in our lives. But what is the basis of that peace? Paul had this to say in Romans 15, 13. He says, now may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we are right with God as the foundation of our peace and we persist in our believing, God gives us joy. And that joy And that peace pushes us on to hope. We can hope that things really will get better. Why? Because we are at peace with God. And I think about my own life. There are times when I have lost my peace. I've given it up through the willful choice of sin. And circumstances have taken that peace from me. But we all come back to our foundation. I am right with God. I believe in the work of the cross. And through my belief, I can attain ultimate, satisfying, eternal peace. I can feel it. Feel it in my soul. I think one of the perfect examples of this is in John 14. Here Jesus is the night before he's getting ready to be crucified. He knows what's coming. He's sitting with his disciples. And look what he has to say to his followers. He says, peace I leave with you. I'm going to die, just like we talked about last week with joy. I'm going to die. I'm going to give you my joy. And I'm going to give you my peace. He says, my peace I give to you. And I do not give to you as the world gives. It's not as the Hebrews thought. It's not as the Greek philosophers thought. My peace is different. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And you know, when I look to Jesus, here he is sitting at the Last Supper, giving peace to his disciples, giving joy to his disciples. And then not even 24 hours later, he's praying and sweat comes forth from his body. And it's not just sweat, but it's sweat mixed with blood. And he is so troubled in his soul. And he even told God, God, I am so troubled in my soul, even to the point of death. And I know everybody in this room has been there, where you have been at peace with God, you have felt peace with God, and then the circumstances has ripped it from you, just like Jesus. And you feel like that you are ready to die. Things are really, really bad. But yet Jesus still has peace. What does that tell us? It means peace with God transcends our emotional state. The emotions eventually will come, just like love and just like joy. But the ultimate peace that we're talking about is peace with God. Even if everything is taken away from us, we can still have peace. Why? Because we're right with God. There are things that take away our peace. And everybody in this room I know, just like Jesus, has been in a point in their time where their peace was gone. They stayed up late at night worrying. They got an ulcer in their stomach. They lost weight. Or maybe you gained this nice rubber tire like I've got because of all the stress in your life, right? I mean, there are things that cause us to have peace and there are things that take away our peace. And as I said earlier, 
We can give our peace up. We can exchange it. We can hand it over. Maybe we listen to too much news. There, I mean, it's like you turn on the TV or open up a newspaper um, or read an article on Twitter or on Yahoo News or something like that, and there's nothing but negativity, and you're overwhelmed by the political pressure and the chaos in the world. I mean, we know what happens in the snap of a finger just like that stresses us out. We exchange our peace for news. Is it worth it? I don't think it is. Maybe we care too much about our likes on social media. I've got to post a picture. So-and-so didn't like my Instagram picture. And we get stressed out. We're like, oh, are we still friends? You, you haven't liked all 15 of my posts that I posted in the last hour. You know, are we still friends? And we get stressed out about it. These are things that we exchange for our peace all the time. Maybe we care too much about what other people think. We want to be loved and respected in the eyes of the people around us. And we care so much about what other people think. We worry and we give our peace away because we're afraid that somebody will think bad about us. Maybe we get too worked up over the small things. You let small things bother you? Towels not folded right? Laundry not put away? Look, I, my kids are training me in the pathway of peace. <laughs> I cleaned the house, did the dishes, mopped the floors. Everything was great. Two hours later, destroyed. <laughs> and I'm like, man, I mean, as a parent, and people told me this, and I never really realized it until I was a parent, you just got to let it go, buddy. And so there are days where I just don't clean and it doesn't stress me out. You just live in a new state, right? You don't let small things bother you. The Greek philosophers had it right. You just stop caring. But seriously, your kids can really stress you out if you let the small things bother you. And there are things that bother us all the time and we hand our peace away. Well, I really want to talk to you about in the next few minutes some things that we dynamically exchange our peace for. Isaiah put it like this, there is no rest for the wicked. And when we choose sin, we are making the willful decision to exchange our peace with God for that temporary pleasure. And the peace does not last and it is not eternal and we feel hopeless. Let me share the first one with you, apathy. And this might come as a surprise. Apathy brings zero peace the Greek philosophers had it wrong. True peace doesn't come from apathetic living. Do you want to lose your peace? There is no better way to lose your peace than not caring about your life. And it will be in chaos. And the people's lives around you will be in chaos. You will constantly be at war because you'll think, I should be doing this. But I'm not because I'm lazy. And I'm apathetic and I don't care. And you will have this eternal struggle in your heart, in your soul, in your mind. And that struggle will now be put off onto the people around you. Last year, I actually researched it and it came back up. Last year, I read, about a, I read a story about a 30-year-old man who had been living in his parents' basement for eight years. And they finally sued him. He had no job over the eight years, probably like Cousin Eddie holding out for a management position. If you're a Christmas fan, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But he lived in his parents' basement for eight years and didn't have a job. And so the parents had to evict him and he refused to leave. So they actually had to sue their son to get his lazy butt out of their house. And so I'm, I'm rereading about this story. They pleaded with him to get on with his life. They gave him cash, moving expenses, like 1500 bucks, I think it was, to get out of the house. And he used it to pay bills instead of moving. Apathetic lazy person. So here he is in court. They sent him legal notices from their lawyer to the, to the man downstairs. Get out. Go get a job. Absolutely refused it. And so finally they took him to court. And the parents said this, there are jobs available even for those with a poor work history like you. Get one and go to work. And he was furious. I cannot believe my parents are kicking me out on the street after cooking my meals and providing a place for me to live and giving me spending money on the weekends. Guys, this is like would be me living in my parents' basement, okay? That's how bad it is. 30, 31 years old, 30 years old, living in his parents' basement. Here's what he says. This is really unfair and outrageous, he said to the judge. I really don't want to stay here. I've been trying to leave for a long time. They stopped feeding me. They cut me off from the family phone plan. And he went on to say, I don't think trying to destroy someone is tough love. <laughs> Dude, apathetic living. You want to talk about people that were suffering because of this man's choices. It was his parents. And it's not necessarily their fault. 
They tried to love their son and help their son. And I think that they did the right thing. But ultimately, look at what apathy does. It destroys your peace. You think not caring is the answer? It's not. That's why a wise man said in Proverbs 18, 9, he who is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. If you want to destroy your peace, be apathetic and lazy. Another thing that destroys your peace is lust. You know, it's one thing to appreciate someone's beauty. It's another thing to be intensely driven to possess someone's beauty and their body for your own. And that's what lust is. It's never pushing stop on the movie in your mind and you crave it. And it never gives you any peace because you're never satisfied. Lust doesn't want the person. Lust wants the pleasure that the person brings them. It's a very selfish thing. I don't want you. I want what you can do for me. I want what you can satisfy in me. Love, biblical love, sacrificially gives. It doesn't demand. It doesn't dictate. It doesn't require. Biblical love sacrificially gives. Lust only steals and it takes from the other person. Lust ultimately robs us of peace because we focus on the wrong things in relationships and in sex. And if you want to see people who have lost their peace, go online and look at all the 20 to 30-somethings who have no peace in relationships. Some of you may know exactly what I'm talking about. You've been down there, you've dated 15, 16 people, you still can't find the one. Well, maybe it's because you're starting from the wrong frame of mindset and you're lusting rather than loving. Lust will rob you of your peace very quickly. In our marriages, in our life, or if we're single, it applies to everybody. Another thing that will rob us of our peace, and this is something that we don't talk about too much in the church, and I know I'm like, all right, I'm the one guilty because I make the most jokes about it, but gluttony will rob you of your peace. And for those of you who are gluttons, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And this is something that I actually can speak on as an authority because I've I've battled with gluttony my whole life. Now, don't get me wrong. We can glutton on food. We can glutton on alcohol. We can glutton on materialism. There are a lot of different things that we can glutton ourselves on. But this is something that we typically don't talk about in the church, right? I mean, we'll stand up and bash the person who gets drunk, but then we celebrate the person who overeats. And that's not something that we should do. The Bible's very clear. Gluttony will rob you of your joy. It will rob you of your self-love. And it will rob you of your peace. And here's why. Gluttony, or a life of, of, of gluttonous activity is an inability to live a life with delayed gratification. You gotta have it right now. And that gives you temporary peace until the next bite or the next drink or the next experience. And so the only way to deal with the problem is to do more. And you find yourself in this perpetual state of self-hatred. You look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, who am I? Who is the person that I've become? And we deal with our stress and our anger and our anxiety by eating or drinking or any other gluttonous activity. And we rob ourselves of our peace because we never deal with the issue. And man, is it quiet in here or what? (laughs) This is an American problem right? I mean, there are some sins that we can struggle with like lust and nobody can see it. But gluttony, a a lot of people can see it. And it's embarrassing. But it's something that we need to deal with. And it's something that we need to recognize. It takes our peace away. Here's the problem. Here's the great mistake with gluttony is it seeks peace directly, directly as a prime product rather than as a byproduct of responsible living. Gluttony robs us of our ultimate purpose in life. Here's what Proverbs has to say about gluttony. Do not be with heavy drinkers of wine or with gluttonous eaters of meat, for the heavy drinker and the glutton will come to poverty. Your peace is going to be destroyed. And drowsiness will clothe the one in rags. When we glutton ourselves on things, we ultimately choose that temporary peace over lasting relationships, over things that will bring us ultimate joy, and we rob ourselves of peace. Temporary pleasure. Gluttony will steal our peace. We hate ourselves because of our destructive behavior. You know, my father, he gluttoned himself on alcohol for the majority part of his life. And then he finally, you know, went to AA, alcohol free, dropped dead of a heart attack at 56 years old. Destroyed my peace as a 14 year old. And there are a lot of situations that I could point to, and you could probably do the same thing, where the gluttonous behavior of of another individual has brought destruction and pain and chaos into your own life. And I can remember as a 14-year-old boy, staying up late at night, worried, anxious, never going to get to talk to my father again. And it destroyed my life as a young man. 
And thankfully, God brought people into my life to help guide me through it. But his bad decision-making brought destruction on my life. And when people aren't responsible with their money and they glutton themselves on physical pleasures, they impoverish their future and they burden their children and their society in their older age. Look, parents, wouldn't we all agree that it's not our child's responsibility to take care of us individually? Or even even our culture. It is not my culture's responsibility to provide for me in my retirement age. So why should I glutton myself on physical pleasures now and rob other people in my future? It's not only a big problem that we have personally, it's a big problem that we have culturally in our own culture. When people aren't responsible with their food intake, they rob themselves of their peace. They hate how they look. They know they're unhealthy. They have to spend money on doctor visits and medical visits and medicine and surgeries because we can't control it. When people aren't responsible with their, with their work lives, you glutton yourself on your work. You're constantly gone with your job and you're never there to love and be with your family. And you rob your kids of your peace because you're never around. And you get stressed out and you take all that negative energy out on the people around you. Look, isn't gluttony a big problem? You're like, look, Rick, we get it. You've been spending five minutes on this. Gluttony will rob your peace. It will rob us and we give up our joy Another one is greed. Greed will rob us of our peace. We'll be bankrupt relationally. The Bible says he who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. Greed robs us of our peace because we become so worried about our money. We can become so anxious about our materialism and we watch our investments every, every few seconds. You know, we're checking the stock market. You know, have I lost money? Have I made money? And we distract ourselves from the things that really matter in life and that's each other. Eventually, we'll run out. We spend all of our time worrying about this money and we have little concern and no concern for God. And that's why Jesus said, it is difficult, impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were all struck. They were like, well, then who can be saved? Who can enter the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. Money isn't the problem. It's the love of money, which is greed. It will rob you of your peace. Another thing that will rob you of your peace is pride. Proverbs 15, 25 says, The Lord tears down the house of the proud. And pride robs us of our peace because we're constantly looking down at others and we can never look up at God. And when you don't look up at God, you don't have peace with him. How can you see the peace of God that transcends all understanding if you're constantly looking down at other people and being at war and competition with them? It will rob you of your peace. And then this is the one I think is probably what we struggle with the most in our culture, envy. Envy will rob you of your peace faster than anything. It's wanting someone else's life. It'll rot your bones is what the Bible says. I want to encourage you I encouraged another couple. Um, they were, you know, marriage conflict. Everybody's got marriage conflict. And I encouraged, I said, look, delete social media for a month. Delete it for a month. Get off at looking at everyone else's life and wanting what they have and desiring what they got. Delete it, get it out of your life, and you'll feel set free. The month over, I said, hey, how'd your, um, your social media fast go? And it was actually a couple weeks after the month. And uh, the person said, I'm still on it. I'm still on my fast. I haven't, even, I haven't even added it back yet. Look, envy rots the bones. One of the worst things that you can do is look at the highlight reel of someone else's life. You will lose your peace. Proverbs 14.30, a heart at peace gives life to the body. You feel alive, but envy rots the bones. And here's why envy is so destructive. is because you look at what everyone else has, and instead of rejoicing with what they have, you mourn for what you don't have. Look at their life. Look at their job. Look at their body. Look at their things. Look at their relationships. Look at all they have and I don't have it. And you start to weep and cry over what you don't have. And it stresses people out, man. You're like, be thankful for what you got. Stop wanting what other people have. These are the things that will rob you of your peace. And a lack of peace really ultimately exposes the idols in our lives. It shows us what we really are loyal to. And so I want to I share with you three quick things that you can do to get peace in your life. And Paul lays this out in Philippians chapter 4. Mark it in your Bible, highlight it, record it, copy and paste it into your notes, memorize it, because this is the pathway to peace for your own life. Number one, pray regularly. That's what Paul says. If you want peace with God, 
Pray to him, talk with him, let him know what's on your heart, let him know what's on your mind, express the desires of your soul, talk to God. This is what I really appreciated about Chris Pratt when he had an acceptance speech. Chris Pratt is my favorite Marvel superhero, okay? Sorry, don't throw stones. I know, it's kind of taboo because he ruined, you know, the whole Marvel universe single-handedly. But uh, anyway, so Chris Pratt's my favorite guy. Well, when he got up to give an acceptance speech, he talked about God and how God loves and how people need to have a relationship with God. And then he also said this, pray and do it often. And that's absolutely true. If peace is the kind of house you live in, you've got to turn on the power of prayer. Prayer powers our minds to think rightly and righteously. And if we are not actively praying on a regular basis, you probably don't have peace. Paul said this in Philippians 4, 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. If you're anxious, if you're worried, or even if you're not, pray. Number two, think rightly. This is where the the battle really takes place. How many of us have role-played in our mind things that we thought that would happen and they never did? And we stayed up at night worried, we got sick worrying about it, never came to be. Or how many of us thought so-and-so was thinking something negative about us or didn't like us and we tried to figure out why and we're getting all stressed and we send this really desperate text and they're like, "Uh, dude, I don't really know what you're talking about, we're cool. Our thoughts is where the battleground is. And so pray regularly, think rightly, and you'll have peace. Romans chapter eight, verse six says this, the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. Do you remember our phrase from last week? If I'm busy doing spiritual things, I won't be doing sinful things. If I'm busy thinking spiritual things, I won't be thinking sinful things. See how that plays out? If your mind is engaged and occupied with the things of God, you won't have any room for sinful things. And so that's why Paul wrote in Philippians 4.8, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure and lovely, whatever is good of repute, whatever is excellence, if anything, worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Think on these things. What you speak about your business transactions, your social relationships, your personal responsibility, being self-disciplined, your home relationships, your leisure activities. Think on these things. That's where the battle takes place, in the battle of your mind. You know, Jesus never abused his imagination with his fears, and he had peace. Don DeWalt put it like this, Jesus never crossed any bridges before he came to them. Jesus never laid awake at nights conjuring up a trial before it came to him. And we might respond with, okay, come on, Rick. It was Jesus, right? It was God in the flesh. Of course he had perfect peace because he saw the beginning before the end. That's the same thing for you and I. Remember what I said at the beginning? Ultimate peace comes at what? Being right with God. You see, even though Jesus experienced suffering and death and he prayed and he mourned and he sweat drops of blood and his emotional peace was taken away. His ultimate peace was never removed because he saw the end before the beginning. And guess what we get to see? We get to see the end before the beginning. We win. We're right with God. We get to spend forever with him. There's nothing that can take that away. And so as you go about your life, Go about your life like Jesus. Yeah, you may endure hardships and trials that mess you up emotionally for a short while, but let your foundation of peace always be the foundation of your hope. And that's the fact that you are right with God and you are at ultimate peace with him. Do you know why people watch movies over and over again? We used to do this all the time when we were kids. We watched like the same movie every day of the week. You guys ever do that? I watch the same movies all the time. And actually, I actually looked this up. It was last year. I was like, why do people watch the same movies all the time? Random Google, I know. Here's the reason. Here's what, here's what the psychology said. It's because it's predictable. You know what they're going to say. You know how it's going to end. And it brings a sense of control back in your life. And there are circumstances that come upon us in our life that makes it feel like we're out of control. And so put on a movie that you've watched before. Bring you back in control. Let's spiritualize that. Focus on what you're promised in Christ. And peace comes back. Pray regularly, think rightly, and then probably the one that many of us struggle with is simply this, act righteously. You know, 90% of successful living is not doing stupid stuff. (laughs) 
I said that last week. 90% of successful living is not doing things that mess your life up. Just avoid failure, in other words. Act rightly. Look what Paul said in Philippians 4.9. Thank you for the laugh. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And look at this. And the God of peace will be with you. Follow me. Do what I do. Practice holy living. Do what's right. Don't do what's wrong. The seven deadly sins that we talked about earlier, the things that God hates. Do what is right and you will have peace. Prayer, thoughts, and action. And you will have inner peace in your soul. And Paul put it like this in Philippians 4, 7. The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your mind in Jesus Christ. Yeah, things go wrong, but I'm right with God. Things will get better. God is in control. He's got this. I trust him. And we can have peace in our lives. Even when things go bad, we can trust God's hand because we trust his heart. And we know that God wants peace for our lives. Maybe not happiness, but peace. And so that's how we get peace. What do we do with it? Simple. Be a peacemaker. Go out and make peace with other people. Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. James 3, 18, peacemakers who sow in peace reap the fruit of righteousness. If you have the peace of God in your life and you know you're right with him and you're praying regularly, and you're acting righteously, and you're thinking righteously, go out and make peace with people. And that's going to be a great expense to your life, but that's what we're called to do. Are you willing to stick out your neck and get involved in the affairs of others, uh, even at your own personal loss? Is there any cost too high for you to be a peacemaker? You see, even though we may not be at war within ourselves and we have peace, we are at war in our culture. And God is calling every person in this room to stand in the gap and be peacemakers. Bring reconciliation together because that brings peace and it brings hope. 